BrethrenNews.com presence. If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And while you're turning there, let me say what a tremendous privilege it is for me to be a part of your conference. I know some of you, uh, we have met, thank you very much, we have met in various places, and uh, but the vast majority of you I do not know, and so I'm really looking forward to meeting you and, and getting to know you. Uh, it is such a joy also to be a part of a conference, especially since the theme is what it is. I personally believe the conveners of the conference are certainly in step with the Holy Spirit as they have chosen a theme so timely. Uh, our brother mentioned earlier in his prayer that many of these truths are slipping away. Many of the foundational principles upon which uh, the assemblies have been built are being compromised and slowly but surely there is an erosion. And so I believe the getting back to scriptural truths concerning the person of Christ must be the first step in any return to a biblical position. I'm also getting, uh, looking forward to getting to know you uh, as we talk in our in our fellowship on a personal level, if you are having a hard time understanding my southern dialect, uh, just stop me and just say, now brother, what did you say? Because southerners tend to add a syllable to words. For example, you might say floor, F-L-O-O-R, a floor. In the south, we add a syllable to that and we call it a floa. Same thing for doa, door. So there might be a little bit of a disconnect here in our communication, but we can get over it very quickly. And, and uh, I'm trusting the Lord for a good conference, a uh, time of rich study around God's Word, and then in our fellowship as well, good, rich fellowship as we grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I trust you have found Ephesians chapter 1, and our topic for the evening is, as we said, uh, so very rich, so very necessary. Christ, the source of growth in the body. I'd like to read three passages here in Ephesians. If you would follow along quietly as I read them, uh, you'll find the first one in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse for sake of time, we will start at verse 17, Ephesians 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And if you take notes in your Bible, I would recommend that you underline or in some fashion highlight the phrase in verse 22, to be head. I'll read it again. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And then if you would turn to chapter 4. And we'll read from verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is 
the head, another phrase there to underline or highlight, who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So there in verse 15, you'll have the second use of this phrase, the head is the head, speaking now of Christ. And then if you will look over to chapter 5, and we'll read from verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. Another phrase to underline. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So ought husbands to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for sake of time, we'll leave off reading there. But you'll see the three uses of this phrase, head, is the head, to be head, there in chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 5. And in many ways, this little phrase is one of the themes of the book of Ephesians. And the topic we're looking at is Christ the source for growth. We're interested in growth, aren't we? If a little baby born into the world didn't grow, we would worry. Living things grow. Now the growth here we're speaking of is, uh, the first thing that pops into our mind is numerical growth. But there is a growth that the apostle speaks of that is not limited to numerical growth, but it's that development or that maturity into, and here the object is, into the person of Christ. Individually, we are to be filled with the Spirit, and as we're filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God will create in you and me as believers the very personality of Jesus Christ. So we become loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and so on. But the assembly is also the object of maturity, wherein the assembly as a body is growing into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the source. Now in your outline, you'll notice that there are about four of these points that we'll uh, look at in our time this evening. And the first one is going back now to chapter 1 and verse 15. Therefore, as I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now down to verse uh, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now our minds go back, don't they? To the Lord Jesus coming in the world, as scripture says, he was full of grace and truth. He worked mighty miracles. He fed the hungry. He gave sight to the blind. He raised the dead. He went about doing good in the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet he came into his own, and his own received him not. And in just a little while, this 
nation, people, turned upon the Lord Jesus and ripped his flesh. They rejected him physically, spiritually, emotionally. They put him on a cross. They did all they could to embarrass and humiliate the Son of God. And in the midst of it all, they cried, His blood be on us and on our children. And there the Lord Jesus, we believe, from early uh, in the morning around 9 o'clock until about 6 o'clock in the evening, there the Lord Jesus suffered more than you and I will ever understand. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep the waters the Savior would pass through. And at the end of that time of suffering, the, the sufferings of Christ is what Peter describes it as, the sufferings, plural of Christ. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus with loving hands took the Lord Jesus down from the cross and they bathed his body in spices and perfumes after wrapping his body and they buried him away in Joseph's new tomb. And there the Lord Jesus was buried away. The world thought they were done with Christ. Let's make no mistake about it that if the Lord Jesus were to come back and walk the streets of our cities like he did 2,000 years ago, obviously we know he will not do that. But if he were to come back and walk the streets of our cities, this world would crucify him all over again. This world has not changed. The world hates Christ. It hated him then, it hates him now. It's the animosity between the, the world and the, the, the revelation of God and you and I as believers are right in the thick of it. Well, the Lord Jesus was crucified and buried away and we can almost hear the forces of darkness applauding, saying something like this, the Son of God, so-called, has been buried away. They wash their hands of the Lord Jesus, his disciples, that weak, trembling little group, stood by as long as they could. Friday came and went. Saturday came and went. The disciples began to scatter. But aren't we thankful that on early Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away. That stone was not rolled away to let Christ out. That stone was rolled away to let the disciples in. The Lord Jesus Christ, raised by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can only imagine that body all wrapped and entombed as it was. And make no mistake, he literally died. Upon the power of the Holy Spirit, moving upon that body, that first flinch, that first breath he took, and all of a sudden the Lord Jesus Christ stood up. He was resurrected from the dead. Critics of the Bible still can't handle that truth, can they? Uh, their view is that he was merely stunned on the cross. After all of that, he was stunned, you know. And the cool air of the tomb resuscitated him. And after a few hours of rest and, and uh, the body healing itself, he got up and walked out. We know these are simply ridiculous uh, reasons that they have come up with to explain away the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But you and I as believers tonight understand that all of Christianity rests on the truth of the resurrection. Paul says if there is no resurrection, you and I are still in our sin. If there is no resurrection, you and I of all men are most miserable. But thank God he is raised from the dead. He's alive. Upon his resurrection, remember scripture says that the Lord Jesus, uh, upon meeting Mary, Mary came and held him by the feet and uh, he said to her, woman, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my father and to your father. And so upon his resurrection, the Lord Jesus did ascend to his father. We're thankful for his post-resurrection ministry. 
in those 50 some odd days the Lord Jesus made about 10 appearances and he was regathering his sheep bringing them back he told them to tarry in the in the in the upper room to wait for the fulfillment of Pentecost or the coming of the Holy Spirit but upon his resurrection Romans 4 says he was raised on account of I believe a more accurate, accurate translation would be he was raised for our justification. Which means had the Lord Jesus not been raised from the dead, the stamp of approval by God the Father would not have been given. Our sins would not yet be paid for. But upon raising him from the dead, God the Father showed his approval of the finished work of the Lord Jesus. He's alive. Word began to spread. Isn't it amazing? 2,000 years have come and go, gone. And here we are gathered tonight. And each one of us who know him as our personal savior, we love him. We know he's alive. We have fellowshiped with him even today. He's alive. Based on his resurrection, you'll notice in verse 20, and I'll read it again, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him, or he enthroned him. He placed him in heaven on a throne. Now, it's not our purpose tonight to look at the Palestinian covenant or the Davidic covenant that during the thousand year, literal thousand year reign of Christ, the Palestinian covenant will be fulfilled. The Davidic covenant will be fulfilled. Christ will sit on the throne of David, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. That's the fulfillment of that Davidic covenant. But even tonight, the Lord Jesus is seated. He has been enthroned. Psalm 110, if you would turn back there for a, a very quick reference. Psalm 110 in verse 1 gives us something of a glimpse of this enthronement. And just from verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, literally it would read, the Lord Yahweh said to my Lord, Adonai. We might paraphrase, God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And this is quoted again in the book of Hebrews where it says, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God. What a statement. God, the Father, calling God, the Son, God. These are truths that you and I do not find new, but they're powerful truths. This is where the book of Ephesians begins. With the resurrection, with the enthronement of Christ. Where is he? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. Here it's Hebrews again. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. He is enthroned. Now practically there are rivals to his enthronement. Positionally, you and I fully agree that God the Father raised him from the dead in the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us an example that now we're raised from the dead at salvation. We are now to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the old life rekindled, but a totally new life. 
But the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, set at the Father's right hand. That is absolutely positionally true. But practically, and this is where our hearts need to be searched in our, in our own hearts and in our own families and in our own assemblies. What about the enthronement of Christ? There are rivals to his enthronement. Uh, there are pockets of rebellion, even in the assembly. It takes an anointed eye, sometimes eye salve, to see it. We'll not spend a great deal of time on this, but if you remember from 3 John, <coughs> the apostle wrote there and said, What you do, just keep doing faithfully. But there is a man there, his name is Diotrephes, and the very next phrase that describes Diotrephes are these words, Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among you. Here's a man, it almost takes our breath away to think, that a man in an assembly loves the preeminence. He loves the spotlight. That very word from 3 John, he loves to have the preeminence, is used in Colossians 1.18, where the apostle wrote and said that in all things Christ would have the preeminence. In all things. But this man, it takes our breath away, loved to have the preeminence. The assembly is the gathering together of God's people and the Lord Jesus Christ is in the midst of every local assembly. We find this in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. In the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus is walking about, looking, examining. He loves his people. He loves his sheep. He loves to be in the midst of them. But for each of those seven assemblies, words of commendation were given. Words of correction were given because he is faithful and true. He doesn't see something and simply let it go or ignore it, but he loves his people so well that he gives us truth concerning our gatherings. And here Diotrephes loved the preeminence. The growth of the assembly would be hurt in an assembly where there was a Diotrephes. Further, it says that he gossiped about John and the traveling brethren. And finally, he was so power hungry that he cast some out of the church and would not receive traveling brethren. Uh, here a man had set up a castle and he had crowned himself king and the Lord's people were hurting. How unlike the Lord Jesus. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul Every time he described himself, he described himself in a lower and lower estimation. First he said, I am less than the other apostles. I'm less than them. Then he said, I am less than the least of all the saints. And finally he said, right before his departure, he said, I am the chief of sinners. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And I would invite us tonight to consider this very carefully. That when pride begins to motivate us in our service, in our worship, in our desire to be seen, the great heart of the Lord Jesus is grieved. The Spirit of God cannot bless where there is pride he cannot bless where there is an evil tongue whipping and cutting. And he certainly cannot bless where there is this restrictive spirit. Things had become so tight that Diotrephes could point out those who could be received and those who would not be received. There was a restrictive spirit. And I would just suggest to us that while this took place about 2,000 years ago, many of these same rivals 
to the enthronement of Christ in our local assembly or in our family or in our own heart. Many of these rivals are still with us today. May I suggest that first of all, Diotrephes loving to have the preeminence was a rival to true worship in the assembly. He wanted the worship. Is that possible today? Is it possible for a man, a woman, a believer <clears throat> to become so enamored with himself, perhaps in some ways not even aware of it, that his strong personality, uh, that his tremendously valued gift has carried him places where he doesn't have the character to stay. Those who are strong personalities are often aware of themselves. And there's nothing wrong with men knowing their gifts and knowing their abilities. Most strong men, most strong women need to know their limitations. They need to know their strengths and their weaknesses. I believe that's why the dear John the Baptist, about whom the Lord Jesus said of men born among women, there has never arisen a greater than John the Baptist, and yet John the Baptist said about himself, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unbuckle his sandal. What a spirit of servitude. There is a hindrance to worship when personalities are in the way. When strong opinions speak more loudly than the word of Christ. This may fall into the category of tradition or culture or custom. And we all have them. The second one would be false teachers rivaling the word of Christ. There is this pride rivaling the worship of Christ, but false teachers rivaled the word of Christ. That the Gentile believers had to first become Jewish and then become Christian. False teachers were everywhere. Gnosticism, Gnosticism taught that you poor, simple-minded Christians, all you have is the Bible. We've outgrown the Bible. Uh, now we have these revelations, this endless stream of angels feeding us information from the glory. We're the intelligent amongst you. There are truths that we can understand. You cannot. Uh, you're the great unwashed. If you'll just follow us, then we can lead you into new realms of religion and new realms of, of reality. And we would say tonight... <coughs> Give us the word of God. Give us the word of God. Thirdly, there is the rival to the work of Christ. That was legalism. Legalism teaches, as it has always taught, that there is some measure of law keeping that is always involved in salvation. Wherever Paul went, he was dogged by these legalizers. You must be baptized. You must, and the list goes on and on and on and on. He is enthroned, and he is the head of his body. You'll find this in verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's his body. He is raised from the dead. He is enthroned. And the assembly, now we're thinking both of the universal aspect and of the local aspect, the assembly is his body. A concept totally unknown in the Old Testament. This body. And what is the head to the body? If we could for just a moment imagine uh, in our own physical body where we are we can feel flesh and we feel our heart pounding. We, we're able to move our fingers and our hands and our toes. All those directions come from some place. We know it comes from our brain. 
When there's an interruption between the brain and the muscle system, there is apoplexy. There are contractions. Uh, the body goes almost in spastic motion. And it's a very sad thing to see. When the body, the assembly, loses sight of, shall we say, is no longer holding to the head, the assembly then begins to move in apoplexy or spasms rather than in unity. Where there is unity amongst the Lord's people, there is the beautiful picture of the person of Christ. It is His body, and verse 23 says, It is the fullness of Him who fills all in all. A little unusual wording there. What does that phrase mean? Verse 23, His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Well, let's break it down for just a moment. The fullness of Him. He's the head. He is resurrected. He is enthroned. He is the head to the body. Not found in the Old Testament, a totally new mystery doctrine given to the Apostle Paul here primarily in the book of Ephesians. This mystery doctrine now that the Lord Jesus... And this really should be a, a precious truth to us. The Lord Jesus is incomplete without his body. Just as in chapter 5, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So husbands, love your wives. But here the head is incomplete without the body. And the body is the fullness of Christ. Now, we might say that there is a vessel and it needs to be filled just by way of illustration a vessel needs to be filled and we find all sorts of things to fill it we find uh, plastic we find metal we find wood we find liquids we find solids and before long this big container is full but full of what? Inferior mixtures of all kinds of materials. Here the truth in the original is that the fullness of him is that the body is to be filled with nothing but Christ. So that there is no admixture. There is not that from legalism or that from the world. There is no place in this assembly gathering for anything but that which is Christ and fills up. Christ is the fullness and he is the head. So when we see it in operation, we simply know that this is the person of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit in a local gathering. You really can't describe it. You just know here is a precious gathering of believers who are holding to the head. So his fullness is what we desire. How is that fullness gained? Turn, if you would now, to chapter Two, chapter 2 and we'll read from verse 19 now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone so we've seen in chapter 1 Christ the head let's let's uh, mark that in our in our notes but remember that truth Christ the head here Christ is the cornerstone he is the cornerstone of the building 
And it says in verse 20 that he is the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you're also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So on him the building rests. That's both theological and practical. Theologically, we know these things to be true. Practically, what does it mean for the assembly to be resting on Christ? I believe we get a view of it in the following verses. In him the building grows, verse 21. The Lord Jesus is perfectly attractive. And when he is seen, there is this drawing ministry. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. If in the assembly our foundation is Christ, our head is Christ, and practically in all of our ministries and all of our goings and comings, Christ is the one in whom we stand, and Christ is the one from whom we gain direction and strength for service. There is something about that gathering that speaks of Christ. We, we're defied, really, to put it into words. I knew a, a young fellow out in Nebraska some years ago. He came into a local assembly. He had been involved with something like a, a motorcycle gang. Um, he had been saved on the streets by one of the brothers in the assembly giving out gospel tracts and so he was invited to the assembly and the first Sunday morning he came in, he walked and sat right down on the front row. He just didn't know better. And uh, he had long hair, long ponytail tail down to his back a cut-off jeans jacket, a chain belt, big black boots, uh, just looked the part of a motorcycle gangster. And there he sat in a conservative local assembly where everyone was dressed conservatively, much like our assemblies would be on a Sunday morning. And there he sat. A big smile on his face as he heard the singing and the preaching, tears came down his eyes when he heard again of the gospel of the grace of God. And he got up and walked out. And people were taking him out for lunch. They were embracing him and nourishing him. But some of the assembly went to the elders and said, listen, it's okay for him to be here for a Sunday or two, but that long hair's got to go. You've got to talk to him about that long hair. and You've got to talk to him about how to dress. And the elders very wisely said, let's just leave him alone for a little while and uh, give him some time. Well, for two or three weeks, he came in and he sat right down there on the front row. He would cry every time the gospel was preached. He would sing. Now, he couldn't sing, but he was singing. You know what I mean? He was singing because his heart was redeemed. He loved the Lord. And one Sunday morning he walked in and he'd gotten a clean haircut. He had gotten some different clothing. He had taken a bath and got all washed up and the dirt out from under his fingernails. And somebody came to him and said, Brother, we're so glad you're here. The Lord loves you and so do we. But what made the difference in your appearance? He said, Well, when I was unsaved, I dressed like people I wanted to be like because I loved them. When I came to the Lord, you became my family, and I began to look around, and I just want to look like people I love. And nobody ever said a word to him about what he needed to do. There's an attractiveness of Christ in the assembly when he's the head and when he's the foundation. He commands growth. Our time is almost gone. I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 5 for just a, a very quick illustration of this attractiveness. The Lord Jesus is attractive. People who are living out in the world, beaten up by the world, think 
they're happy. Can you explain how someone getting drunk all night long, waking up the next morning and just throwing up everything in their system, how that's fun? They think it is. They think that's living. But when someone comes to the Lord Jesus and has a clean spirit, the guilt is gone. The joy of the Holy Spirit is like an artesian well springing up. That's living. And the Lord Jesus is attractive. He is, he's the lily of the valley, as the writer of Song of Solomon would say. He's fairer than the thousands. And he's still attractive tonight. And there are still people who need to hear his word and see love and action. They need to see the grace of God reaching out to them. That's where growth takes place. But not simply evangelistic growth, growth in the body, that is for Christians who are growing in their maturity as well. But in this matter of the Lord able to cause growth, look to chapter 5 of Luke and we'll just break in right at verse 4. When he had stopped speaking... He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, perhaps you have seen, you have heard ministry on this little conversation. If you have not seen it, we would like to ask the question once again. When the Lord Jesus said in verse 4, let down your nets for a catch, why did Simon only let down a net? Of course, there is a lack of faith, isn't there? When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. If they had let down the nets instead of net, they would not have lost their net. To the, the amazing amount of fish that the Lord directed to their net. I believe the same thing took place in the, in the ark when God told Noah, come thou into the ark. And he directed all of those animals to go to Noah in the ark. Somehow there is an attractiveness. He is the source for growth. No wonder prayer is so important. He's the source. A number of years ago, we called for a day of prayer at our local assembly, and the ladies met from, actually the men met from about 8 o'clock in the morning till about 12 and prayed for those four hours. Then the ladies came, and they prayed all afternoon. And we were asking the Lord for uh, three new families to come into the assembly. And we had a day of prayer, then we had another day of prayer, and after about three of these days of prayer, um, three new families had come into the assembly. And we looked at one another and said, why didn't we pray for ten? There is power in our source, and our source is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is resurrected he is enthroned. He is the head. He is the foundation. And for lack of time, let me just mention these. In chapter 4, he is the source for the body. He joins, he knits, and he causes growth. And then in chapter 5, he is the lover of the bride. The Lord Jesus looks down on planet earth and he is more interested in the gathering together of God's people than any other event taking place on the globe. He loves his people. He's our source and tonight it's our privilege to recognize him afresh as the resurrected head to recognize him as our cornerstone, our foundation. In fact, we could ball it all up and say, he is our all 
and our all. Aren't we glad for him tonight? Isn't it good to be saved? Isn't it good to be in a local assembly? Isn't it good to know that the Lord Jesus is coming back? May we afresh tonight look away from ourselves, perhaps our problems, perhaps things that might have been grieving us on the way to our conference. May we tonight look off unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and see in him our all in all. May we pray. Our Father, how we thank you tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, that he is the resurrected Savior, that he is the head in heaven, that he is our chief cornerstone, that he is the source for all our need. We thank you that he is the lover of the bride. And tonight, our Father, we would say, even though feebly, we love you, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. Thank you for your finished work on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you, our Father, for all that the Lord Jesus has done for us. We give you our thanks and our praise in his matchless name. Amen. Presented by BrethrenNews.com.